This is Control Structure, episode 113, for August 10th, 2016. Big week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs113 to see them. I'm your host, Stephen Orvis, and with me is the other host, Andrew Bailey. Hi, Steve. Hi, Andrew. We've got this down to a formula. How so? How, how should I say this? Like, we have some of this typed into the document, and then, you know, we say, it's like, I am host such and such, and with me today is the other host, such and such. Hi, host. Hi, host. Yes, we do do it the same exact way every single time. Yeah, we should look into doing something else. Okay, we'll have to come up with some crazy idea. We can swap our names or get different names or something. Get different names. Hmm. Or maybe we can just uh, do it like a sequel statement or something. Okay, we could do something like that. Uh, like, uh, select Andrew, comma, Steve from uh, Control Structure. Yeah, I, I thought you were going to make like a select something from Dual Joke or something like that. Eh, if, oh. on, only if you're uh, on Oracle. So, what is it? Uh, I believe it's Select Star <laughs> from Dual. If, if I'm remembering... Okay, I did not even spell <laughs> Dual right. So <laughs> Dual. Like Dual. If I yeah. actually remembered what it says... No. No. No, we will not sign yes. up to your newsletter. Invalid object and dual. No, that's not what I remember the saying. Anyways, there's something about uh, a dummy table or something. It's yeah. Just select from dummy or something like that. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm one of. I want to say that it's an oracle thing. Oh, that that could could be why. Yeah. We have oracle at work, and that was where I heard about it. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, it's been hot, and we've mostly been staying inside. Uh, let's see, Saturday, I think I rode 17 miles. That's which, quite a long ways. Which might be a record. And uh, yeah, Sunday, I did like 14 or something. Uh, so, uh, I let me guess, you're probably not that familiar with the North, sh- with the North Shore, like where the stadiums are. Uh... I drive by them all the time, but not really. So, in front of Heinz Field on Sunday, like there, it looked like there was like a bunch of, like a competition of people doing BMX tricks and stuff on the trail in front of the uh, uh, the Steelers Stadium. Is that the bicycles where they like do jumps and such? Yes. Okay. So, you know, I'm you know I just you know got down on the trails like okay, you know. Just time to relax and just enjoy the view. And then suddenly there's like a whole crowd of people and stuff. And I'm like, what in the world's going on here? So like I had to, you know, like grab my bike and walk it up these steps to like get around this crowd and ride on the uh, street for a little bit. So and it looked like they had food there. So that's probably why I was like smelling like, you know, French fries and stuff Uh like a few blocks down uh, at the tea station where I got off. At first, I thought it was because uh, it was my uh, helmet, because like there's like little like absorbent pads around the edge, and uh, you've been like by fast food places and well, absorbed in the, the fumes. No, no, it's because I haven't washed those, and they kind of smelled like a mix between vinegar and garbage. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> yum. So uh, it's like oh, so that's probably what I was smelling. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was able to, you know, like completely go around there. And unfortunately between that and the fact that there, uh, looked like they were redoing a park, like a little park or something next to the trail, uh, on the other side, uh, of, uh, PNC park that like I needed to ride on the street anyway. So like I was on the street for like a few blocks there, a little bit more than what I was comfortable with. Imagine it could be pretty busy down in there. And... But uh, it was essentially mostly parked buses. Okay. So it wasn't that bad. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and then I have finally noticed I have a little tan line, like, right above my knee here. So that uh, that will be going away though when winter comes. Yeah, that that is pretty much exactly where my bike pants come down to. Okay. 
like you can see it like right here. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah, I, I could see it when darker. you showed me earlier outside. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. So anything cool happen? Uh, this year happened. I went to see a property last night. Uh, this weekend, I'm going camping uh, out cool. by Tioga Hamming Lake, up kind of towards New York direction. So looking forward to that. So um, several months ago, I asked Zach, a uh, new member of the church, you know, it, it kind of seemed like he was a guy who like had all the uh, old id games. Mm -hmm. So uh, finally, he has given me Doom, Quake. And like Half Life in ah, the two exp in the there two you expansions. Go. So you're you're thinking 20th century there. I'm I'm assuming. Um yeah, I've already loaded it up on there, so uh, that's cool. Nice. Um also, uh like a lot of old games, uh like they use CD audio on the disc for music in the game. So you have to put the disc in when you play it. Uh that or you need to image the disc in a certain format that allows you to retain both the data on the disc and the audio tracks. So you're saying DD doesn't copy it? Um, it might, but, uh, like, the whole idea is, like, a normal ISO file is just a file system, and on a CD, a file system only exists within one track on the disc. But if there are music uh, tracks on there, it will not catch those. Okay. So, like, a regular ISO file will not work. I see. So, like, I was, you know, going around, I was like, bin Q files seem a little weird because you have this file that is ostensibly, like, a copy of the disk bit for bit, uh -huh. and then this other file that tells you where all the tracks are in that mess. Interesting. I assume DD would be able to copy something like that. Well, maybe reading it would probably be the second problem there. So... And then uh, there, there, I think like there's an image format from Nero. Ever heard of Nero Burning ROM? I actually used to have Nero software that I used way back. Yeah, apparently ninety eight. Yeah, apparently they have like their own image format that will capture all the of those. .ngr, nrg yeah. or something. Yeah. And then I think uh, like Alcohol one twenty percent has another format. So like. I'm trying to evaluate all of these and, like, trying to get a program that will actually write these files. Yeah. Uh, anyways, so while I've been, you know, uh, loading up 20th Century and playing a little bit on it, what I have not been doing and what you have not been doing is playing Pokemon Go. Definitely not. Because uh, we don't watch TV. We don't watch TV. Yep. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. So, um, there's been lots of news floating around about, uh, you know, like people, uh, doing dumb things and finding strange things, uh, while playing Pokemon Go and not paying attention to their surroundings. Um, but there's another side to this in which, uh, apparently this mother of an autistic child is extremely thrilled that her son, her autistic son, is finally talking to people and, like, actually interacting with other people. And it's because this game that he can bond with other people or at least have a conversation and look them in the eye and say, thank you for, like, telling me all of this. It, it seemed like he got so involved in the game from the article and just so excited that uh, he forgot about being shy and just like naturally wanted to blurt out and talk and and uh and have fun at the game which is interesting yeah he's usually so rigid about his routine and rigid in all caps uh, but tonight he was happy to change things up and do it we were in shock these total strangers were giving him advice like there's one right around the corner buddy go get it and he would run off laughing to get it he would even look at the, look up at them and say thank you. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. So, another thing that's pretty cool uh, is, remember that uh, ALS uh, Ice Bucket Challenge? Was that the one you all did at church? Uh, sort of. Um, but it was like more of a personal touch thing. So, 
uh, you know, the idea of the ice bucket challenge in general was to, uh, like, donate some money and bunch a dump a bunch of ice water on your head. Yes, I, I remember so, seeing the ice water but, something you but, had video. But apparently my pastor is special and wants to do something creative. So he uh, uh, instead decided that, you know, we would take up a love offering. Then the entire church would get dumped or, excuse me, the men of the church would get dumped by the ladies of the church. Uh, and then we would uh, give the money to a missionary whose wife actually has ALS. So, like, they can help her out and, like, go to a nice restaurant or something. Yes. Um, but anyways, like, all these donations that uh, came into the ALS Foundation has actually resulted in the discovery of a new gene for ALS. Uh, so uh, hopefully this can be the target of some kind of uh, therapy uh, that can actually help people out. So good job. Oh, very nice. So um, you've been uh, sort of reading and looking at this uh, uh, one guy's shed. Yes, apparently he works from home too, and he wanted to not work in the house so that he didn't mix work and life and uh, separation and uh, from the noise and such of the family, and also because he works with batteries and things that might explode slash burn, catch on fire. So he just thought it was maybe a good idea. So he got this shed. It looks like it's uh, maybe set up to be a little bit of an office shed because it yeah. had some insulation in it and, and things. But it was bare inside, and he put insulation in it. Some and more. Some more, yes. Like a lot more. Uh, yeah, I think he put in like layers in between the studs, and then he put like the foam insulation on yeah. the outside. And he put plywood in, and he put in a heat pump. So that gives him cooling and heating. And he uh, had some batteries next to the well, side, and and like a uh, uh, like a window, almost like a window air conditioner. Yeah, that would be that would be the heat pump because it can do both. Well, yeah, that's right. Uh, and uh, he had solar panels too. Now, the panels he said cost like six thousand dollars. He must have got like a good good deal of panels. I didn't see the actual footage that he said he had. Uh, but I think he said he had like two thousand watts worth. Okay, so that's a fair amount then, two thousand watts. Okay, he, his solar system, uh, two thousand two hundred eighty watts of nameplate capacity. So that's pretty yeah. substantial. He has his battery array was kind of interesting by his uh, shed thing there. Yeah, his what his eight batteries there in it. Uh -huh. uh, imagine they're probably like the deep cycles. I I would assume. Yeah, lead acid definitely. Yeah, but. Uh, yeah, that was kind of interesting. And the one problem I saw with this, now he says he lives in like a, a dry area, and so I'm assuming that means maybe he doesn't get that much cold. Uh, I would see a problem being uh, snow landing on top of the, the panels in the wintertime and building up. Now, you thought maybe with the blackness they might melt, which might be true. But, but uh, um, generally, if you live in a dry place, it does get very cold. Okay, so at least... You know, like Utah yeah. is a fairly dry place. It gets just as cold as it does here. Okay. And it might actually feel a little bit worse. Do you get snow, though? Um, got, got quite a bit of snow out there. Okay. So, but, you know, again, it depends on, you know, you know, just like there is here, there is lake effect mm. on the Great Salt Lake. Okay, that would make sense. So, yeah, like... Uh, I remember several times that, you know, down in the valley, we would get, oh, maybe a good 10 inches or so. And then, like, I'd hear, like, up in the mountains, they got 10 feet. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's quite a bit. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, it's reasonable that he may have snow. I suppose that's the thing. Maybe you just take a broom and knock the snow off in the morning time. So that, I mean, that's probably not a big deal. If you well, the wall. then, then again... Like, he just did this. Yeah. So, he hasn't yeah. tested the snow yet. Exactly. Yeah, that's an interesting idea, though, because he's running the heat pump and his computer's on those batteries and presumably lighting in there, too, uh -huh. which that makes it uh, impressive and an interesting concept, too, uh, assuming you have your internet connection someplace there. Yeah, drop so, so he mentioned that, uh, you know, along with being dry, apparently, like, he can't exactly dig a a trench 
because there's like basalt, like really hard volcanic rock everywhere. So, uh, you know, that's you know, one of the reasons why he did an off grid uh, type of thing. And apparently he has a little wireless transmitter in the window to point back to the house for the internet connection. Okay, so that gives him his internet then. So, cool. So let's do something a little, uh, uh, I guess, irreverent and uh, appreciate this uh, very buzzword-laden resume that uh, pretty much feeds into all the negative stereotypes of startup companies, uh, you know, uh, of working long hours to implement vague ideas with no autonomy for vague promises of getting rich one day. <laughs> After all, money is the only thing that motivates anyone, right? Uh, yeah, you'll get to work with all of our C-level uh, C-level executives as they order you around on a daily basis. Uh, we're an agile team, so long as that means cutting corners to meet sales deadlines. Uh, so plan on working 100 plus hours a week during sprints. If that scares you, don't apply. We don't want people who are scared by silly things like reality. Get, on, get in on the ground floor of a catastrophe that's sure to hit the front page of TechCrunch. So, yeah, have fun with that. I thought that was a, a pretty good mockery of job descriptions. And it's true, you've, I've seen quite a few that sound a lot like all those... All those things. So, um, and as a slight side note, we are interviewing people at my company. So, uh, like the hard part of, you know, actually giving an interview is what kind of questions should you ask the, uh, the job seeker? So I guess I'm a fan of the open-ended questions. Kind of letting them answer uh, and see what they come up with. Yes, like nothing... You know, it doesn't exactly have a right answer, but there's not any bad answers outright. So, like, the first guy uh, that came through last week, uh, I asked him, so, model a game of Monopoly. And, you know, everyone kind of disagreed with that. Then I'm like, okay, or maybe another game that you like. And he's like, well, I just played Bingo yesterday, so can I do that? It's like, yeah, sure, fine. So, uh, there's, did that, and then just, uh, did another one today, and I asked, when you type in a URL into a web browser, what happens? So you're just trying to get into their head and see how they think. Yeah. Like, what's, ki what's kind of important to them, mm -hmm. and whatnot. So, uh, you know, he basically delved right into like the sequence of requests going back and forth, you know, on HTTP. Whereas I was like more interested in, it was like, okay, well, like how is this parsed? Like yes. go out and, you know, do the DNS request, you know, stuff like that. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, the, the final answer to that is like all interview questions kind of suck. Which is true. I, I've been at interviews before in the past, and there comes the question that I, I really hate this question, I'm sorry, but we have to ask you it. Why should we not hire you? <laughs> or, you know, questions like that. It's like, seriously, you want me to answer that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I actually uh, get to go back to Geneva here, and I think towards the end of September, and do like a mock interview. Uh, me and one of the other ones that worked through going back and just do mock interviews for the students. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. would be interesting just to, just to do for fun. And it's not like they're actually hiring people, so it doesn't <laughs> really uh, matter. So, yeah, that's that's your uh, where you went to school, yes. right? Yes. Yep, that's where I went to college. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, so let's see. There was another uh, thing about that. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of weird, you know. The, oh... Uh, and then the, the one of the weirdest questions that I've been asked in an interview is uh, about Java. I think there are uh, finalizers, which are kind of like destructors, but because it's sort of like a JIT runtime where garbage collection kind of happens, but it's not guaranteed it to happen. may or may not. I remember reading about this once, yes. Yeah, and, you know... I had no, I, you know, I was not familiar with them at all. Like, I don't really see a proper application of them. Yeah, it's like... You know, because, 
you don't exactly want to close your database connection in one of those because you don't know if it's going to get closed or not. Exactly. And you can't exactly wait around for the garbage man to come by and, you know, clean this out so it will actually run. Um, so, you know, I guess that this company had run into a problem with these or like maybe had to have a solution that involved these. But I have never used them ever. It seems like more oddball feature and kind of like the point you're making is out of the way. So it's like, why ask an out of the way question when you can ask something more useful and relevant that you're likely to be reading? Okay, so we just looked at Stack Overflow. Let's see here, you can use this as a backstop for an object holding an external resource, blah, blah, blah. I think those detect maybe extra safety, an exceptional bugging amount, and that kind of stuff. It's really needed, comes with overhead. Sounds like the top question is saying that that's not exactly the most useful thing out there, but it has its uses. Raspberry? Raspberry? Raspberry. Mm. Did you get neighbors? No. Raspberry! <laughs> awesome! Okay, so currently the Raspberry Pi 3, do you remember how we got the Raspberry Pi 3 recently? Yes. Apparently there are new boot modes in the Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, you don't have to use an SD card anymore. One of the ways, which is still kind of in beta testing, they say, is you can boot off of your USB device, meaning Ooh. flash drive, external hard drive, so on and so forth. I, uh, but they pointed out that it would be a little bit slower than the SD card itself, so you're not getting performance, unfortunately. Well, uh, well, if you used a fast enough thumb drive, it might actually be fast. Guess the question would be: I'm assuming it's USB 2.0, not 3.0. Ooh, that's so right. That to me would be the bottleneck. 3.0 might. Yeah. You can get pretty decent speeds with that. Uh, the other boot mode they introduced, which actually I never thought about before, it was kind of an obvious one, is network booting, mm -hmm. uh, which that is incredibly useful for IoT because that means now I can have like a grid of Pis out there and have some server they connect to, and I could uh, simply update them by rebooting the Pi and it pulls a new image down and does some really cool, awesome thing. I could deploy like a whole grid of Raspberry Pis and they all network boot, and then I can just have them connected and do stuff. When I want to update it, I just push up the image, and bam, they all have it. Mm -hmm. There's like endless possibilities there. So I, thought, I thought that was a very good step for the Pi Foundation. It's a nice thing I've seen them doing. They, they're not, they made the Pi, it's good, solid. A lot of people have it, but they haven't stopped. They're always coming up with new stuff, making it better, which is really great for what the Pi Foundation does. So, um,. We mentioned a little while ago about how Microsoft open sourced their JavaScript engine. I vaguely remember it. Yes, along with all the other things that they've been open sourcing and putting on Linux and stuff. I do definitely remember that part. So uh, they've actually gone and used their JavaScript engine for Node.js. So, um, you know, uh, so like the current uh, conventional backend is V8 which is what uh, Google Chrome uses. So, uh, you know, again, this they're actually, you know, hey, we can actually fit into this ecosystem over here. And uh, they act, can actually run it on uh, a Mac and Linux now. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, that they're actually supporting things, not Windows. And, uh... So um, speaking about Microsoft things uh, and Linux, so, uh, you've gotten the Windows 10 Anniversary Edition, right? I did get it on this laptop. So, have you tried out Bash yet? I have not, because Windows boots really slow now for some reason, and I just didn't really care. Fair enough, uh, because you're running Ubuntu right now anyway. Yes, and lately I've been running it most all the time, and I recently discovered Tinks, and that works in Ubuntu quite nicely on my desktop. 
So, yet another reason not to go to Windows. So, um, I guess this is not happening each and every time, but apparently a f several people have been reporting that the Windows 10 anniversary update has been uh, nuking partitions that it uh, does, you know, does not have. So, like, it does something with the uh, the uh, partition table on your drive, and it somehow, uh, you know, nukes any uh, unrecognized partitions. So, if you have a dual boot, you might be at risk here. That's uh, such a handy feature, Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, like, we've sort of always known that Windows doesn't exactly play nicely. Uh, so, like, if you... Uh, you know, are dual booting Windows and Linux and you need to reinstall Windows for some reason, well, Windows likes its own bootloader. Yes. It's always been standard, you know, if you do something with Windows like install a new OS, go ahead and uh, unplug the Linux drive if you can and then don't mess it up. Otherwise, deal with reinstalling Grub, which is fine sometimes. But this was just like an update. Uh, theoretically just an update, but I think it was more uh, like I texted you, Andrew, they were saying something about uh, that don't worry, your files are safe, they're still where you left them, and all that stuff that Microsoft yeah, printed out. So, so I installed what I'm pretty sure was the anniversary update, uh, but at some point it bailed and said, you know, you know, after a few minutes, you know, rebooting and whatnot, it said, restoring your previous version of Windows. And I'm thinking, previous version of Windows? What? You mean I'm going back to 7? <laughs> it's like, it's already like July, or no, it would have been like August 2nd. The, free, the free update is over. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thankfully I uh, saw the dark blue of the Windows 10 uh, loading screen, and I'm like, okay, good. I'm sort of back to where I was a few minutes ago. So, um, but still don't have the anniversary update. So I wonder if at some point it will just completely refuse to update everything because I don't have that one. It's an interesting question. I mean, you had said before you had trouble with updating from 7 to 10 anyways, and you had to do a full re-image, right? Uh, no, actually. You did that to work? Yeah. Okay. So, and I'm... I'm not sure if this is this is why it didn't do the anniversary update, but even though you know installing ten from seven, uh, the uh, whole thing where I have the hard drive be my user's data directory and have the SSD be pretty much everything else. Yes, that still works. Okay, and like there was like no problems whatsoever uh, going to ten with that. Awesome, and apparently. Uh, Windows 10 does support the, uh, you know, like, doing the same thing about, you know, when you're installing it, you can boot into audit mode, and you can do, uh, like, a uh, the same kind of redirection there as I did with 7. Okay. Yeah, audit mode is a pretty interesting feature is of Windows. Is it kind of like the live CD? I don't know that I've seen that really before. <laughs> Not really. It's more... Uh, useful to OEMs where uh, like Windows is kind of technically installed but the user profiles have not been generated. I know what you're talking about. Now, and so like you can tweak it and, yeah. yeah, supposedly they can tweak it and install all your drivers and stuff uh, so you're like good to go immediately. Yes. So, yeah. It's been a long time. So, um along with, you know, deleting uh, alien partitions uh, maybe one of those extra partitions had BTRFS on them. Uh, hopefully no one is using their RAID 5 or 6 mode, because that recently was discovered to be horribly unstable and nobody should use it. Uh, fatally flawed, in fact. Uh, more or less so, and a full scrap and rewrite to an entirely different mode on disk format may be necessary to fix it. Uh, so, uh, this, you know, we've talked about BTRFS plenty of times on the show, and it's essentially like a next generation file system where uh, like uh, you're sort of familiar with a software type of raid yes where like the operating system kind of you know fuses together the disks instead of like going into the bios yep. and having the hardware do it so 
like BTRFS kind of merges that uh, like any kind of uh, multi-disc spanning thing into the file system itself um, and their uh, raid 5 and 6 modes were kind of interesting because it pretty much is supposed to do what it says on the label uh, but with uh, you know BTRFS you can dynamically add and remove discs so like you add in a disc you run a I think it's a uh, like a rebalance command and then after a while like all your all the data is you know like sort of smoothed out over the discs and then if one of them uh, explodes or something you run another rebalance command so like everything is sort of back and excludes yes. yeah but apparently that does it, that doesn't quite work right so um you know, when, you know, everyone was talking about BTRFS initially, I was like, hey, that's kind of cool. I might use that. But then uh, hard drives continued to get bigger, and I decided that I really didn't need it anymore. So There were two point where it's, like, really cheap, really good ones are super cheap now. It's Yeah, it's... like, it turns out that a 4 terabyte hard drive holds pretty much everything. You know, like, all of my video and music archives and, like, all the backups and stuff, like, all that can fit within four terabytes. Um, that is excluding the uh, the backups from the game download services. So that's your Steam, that's your good old games, that's your Origin, and uh, Humble Bundles. So, yeah. Turns out you can store a lot these days and pretty cheap. So, uh, Mozilla... You remember those people? Uh, yes, I they they made a browser or something. Yeah, uh, f I think it was like Foxfire or something. Like no one actually uses it anymore. Nah. So uh, they've donated over half a million dollars to uh, nine open source projects, or uh, or at least they're going to uh, for this year or this quarter or something. So you might have heard of some of these. Uh, apparently they're still trying to figure out the ninth, but they've already donated to Tor, Tails, Caddy, Mio, DNSSEC slash Dane Chain Stapling, uh, Godot Engine, Pairs, and NVDA. So, uh, like if, you know, you I think we've pretty much mentioned Tor before, that's the Onion Network or no, the onion router rather. Um, you know that's like kind of the dark net stuff where you know you go to a node and from there it's encrypted and stuff and it sort of spreads your traffic out amongst the whole world. So it's you know very difficult to trace what you're doing. Uh, Tails is a Linux live distribution that is you know focuses on security and all of that. Um, and then NVDA is a screen reader, which I've actually tested my blog with. So, um, like it has, uh, like voice, uh, or no, speech or text to speech type functionality as well. Yes. So, so I was thinking, where did Mozilla get this kind of cash from? Then I was thinking about, uh, I think I've heard of companies like Google and Microsoft donating money at various points in time. Yeah. So, uh, they had a deal going with Google for over 10 years, uh, back in the day, rather, yes. that, uh, you know, in exchange for being the default search engine, here's like, I don't know, $300 million or something. Uh, and then after that fell through, I think they went to Yahoo. So I think we actually mentioned that uh, they switched to Yahoo being the default. Yes, we did talk about that, and we were all annoyed by that, uh, <laughs> them changing our default, default web browser. Uh, but then, search engine. But then, uh, some of us started using DuckDuckGo. Yes, yeah, some of us. <laughs> I still haven't quite like. It would be nice to use DuckDuckGo, but I just I tried it a couple of times and I just wasn't happy with what I was getting back. So, I've generally been happy with it. So, uh, I discovered the uh, the search bang for the Mozilla Developer Network. The search bang. What's that? So. Uh, for DuckDuckGo, there are a few 
other websites that it will redirect your search terms directly to there. Uh Oh, so it's, it can also act as your, like, uh, sort of like an entry point. Yeah. Yeah. Like an intermediary or something. Yeah. So like, instead of searching DuckDuckGo for this website, it pretty much forwards you as if you typed this search term into the search box of this other website. So instead. Say, you could, say you could redirect your search to Stack Overflow, since you're only going to answer, click on links to Stack Overflow anyways, why not just go there in the first place? Exactly. So, uh, like, they even have uh, search bangs for uh, XKCD. Nice. Although, uh, I, although I don't think that XKCD actually has their own search, so in that case, it will uh, searching, do... but it's searching within the site XKCD. Yeah, so yeah. you you will end up on a DuckDuckGo page for that. So yeah. So uh, most of YouTube's traffic is HTTPS, over ninety seven percent. If they can do it, everyone can. So uh, I'm I'm actually pretty sure that most of Netflix's traffic is encrypted as well, and. Uh, like, Netflix accounts for over one-third of all internet traffic in the evenings. One-third? That's yeah. quite a bit of traffic. So, uh, and YouTube has about half of Netflix's traffic, but that's still quite a bit. And uh, so, you know, being a Google property, they uh, they're, they like to explain how they do things, at, you know, for some yes. stuff. So... Um, one of the things that they found, uh, you know, going to HTTPS is the integrity guarantees. So apparently they found that HTTPS improved the quality of experience on most clients. By ensuring content integrity, we virtually eliminated many types of streaming errors. So I thought the whole point of uh, TCP versus UDP was it actually was going to be the same thing when you got there, what you sent. Or at least in the same order. Same order, and like you, if you lose a packet, it resends the packet. Uh, but there are other, you know, uh, there are other layers interacting on top of TCP that could cause an error. Um, also, like the uh, uh, how should I say, the checksum on uh, TCP and IP are only like sixteen bits. So, like, that's not exactly a good uh, uh, space when you are trying to hash, like, I don't know, like a kilobyte and a half. Meaning you're going to get collisions yes. fairly fr- frequently. Yeah, even for, uh, you know, mistakes in the data stream. So, uh, you know, uh, TLS does have other integrity guarantees on top of that. So, that's good for that. It's interesting. So, um you know, then there's also sometimes a ISP or a provider might subtly modify traffic. So, yeah. It stops that, too. Yes. So, good job, YouTube. And it actually works on Fios now. Nice. So, um, how should I say this? Paul Henning Camp is not exactly as much of Taliban as... Uh, uh, was it Richard Stallman? But this Paul Henning Camp guy is still a little crazy. Uh, he's the guy behind FreeBSD. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he's saying here that more encryption means less privacy, which sounds kind of stupid, right? Initially, it does, does sound kind of uh, counterintuitive. So he's basically saying that... Uh, uh, you know, the government's desire to, you know, eavesdrop on everyone has been kind of hampered by suddenly everyone encrypting everything that they possibly can. So he's criticizing this defense because, uh, you know, governments really want to, you know, keep track of stuff. So if they suddenly can't, it's a big deal for them. So, like, they actually have, you know, governments have the power to change things, uh, such as like actually backdooring encryption, uh, like inserting, uh, you know, doing, you know, legally sanctioned man in the middle attacks and like a whole bunch of other nasty things because suddenly everyone is using encryption. Uh, So he posits that, you know, the solution to all of this um, 
Uh, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, these ideas are all based on the same principle. If we cannot break crypto for a specific criminal on demand, we will preemptively break it for everyone. And whatever you may feel about politicians, they have the legitimacy and the power to do so. They have the constitutions, legislative powers, courts of law, and police forces to make this happen. The IT and networking communities overlooked a wise saying from soldiers and police officers. Make sure the other side has an easier way out than destroying you. But we didn't, and they are. Slapping unbreakable slapping unbreakable encryption onto more and more things is just going to make things worse. The only way to retain any amount of electronic privacy is through political engagement. Which makes sense. It does make sense, and you I have seen the attitude before with the government towards uh, software encryption software, even like the famous software that they went out to export so they made a book so that they could export it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in other words, without political engagement, governments are more likely to employ brute force with a $5 wrench. <laughs> and XKCD of the hitting the guy and uh, making him tell the, the password. password. For his uh, 4K uh, RSA uh, machine. And now some deprecate. Okay, so I was going to deprecate uh, inbox.com. Not box, inbox. Meaning the uh, free email service from years gone by. I looked in to see when I signed up for mine, uh, and it was actually about 10 years ago, more or less, was when I signed up for my account. Anyways, I got an email from them yesterday saying that they've uh, decided to uh, end... And they're free email, and now if you want to have email, you actually have to pay like $20 a year for it. And uh, so that's that. They're shutting it off in the end of September. I think it's kind of a, a, a interesting concept, though, because while Inbox is kind of an obscure now email provider, what if someone like Google or Yahoo decided that, hey, I think we want to make money from our email account now and shut it off? for people that don't want to pay us. Uh, that's your identity. That kind of is who you are on the internet. Who knows how many people has your email address that you want to have it or websites that you signed up like your bank or or online services, maybe your domains registered to it and that's like the only contact point they have. Uh, it could be important stuff that hinges around your email. So yeah, it was interesting uh, that what you see as stable free email actually isn't necessarily stable. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you for posting this on Prove It with a Unit Test, and I just submitted that to Hacker News. Nice. I'm now a official blogger that's read by people. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I'll let you know if it gets any upvotes. Okay. So I think I was the first blogger to talk about it, because I didn't see any thoughts on Google, so... Yes. I mean, who knows? So, if you would like to submit feedback uh, on this or any other uh, email service provider closures, uh, go ahead and do so on the nexus.tv. Uh, you can, uh, there is a link uh, right on the side that you can submit feedback. So, we'd appreciate it if you would. Uh, so, yeah, it looks like I might have to be uh, reinstalling my uh, server uh, pretty soon. Or maybe not have to, have to, but uh, uh, might be in the future. And if I do so, I will uh, look into encrypting the drive. Sounds like that'd be a fun project. Yes, and uh, installing Drop Bear in my bootloader so that uh, it will be able to, you know, have an SSH uh, server running so I can log in to unlock the rest of the drive. Uh, if, like, the power goes out. Uh, another thing that I want to do is finally set up some kind of uh, VPN. So, like, if I'm out somewhere, uh, like, on a free Wi-Fi mm -hmm. or something, I can, you know, funnel all my traffic through to here. Yes. Uh, so it's, like, not in the clear text anywhere else. Um, but then that's also a really good way to tell if my server is off. Because the VPN won't work. It's true. <laughs> so yeah. then I'll realize, 
oh, I'll have to log in and uh, fix this. Yes, that's a good idea. I've thought about setting up a VPN before on our home network and doing that. That would uh, be a handy thing to have. I heard before you can really just do it with an SSH tunnel. Is where you can tunnel like in. a SOX proxy. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, you, know, you tunnel in and pretty much you have access to the network. You join the two networks together. Um, sort of. Like the only reliable way I've found of doing that is through a web browser, but not through anything else that happens on a system. Okay. So I, I never tried it, but I read about it, and it sounded like it would work from what I had read. Yeah, uh, but. Like, unfortunately, operating systems don't really have VPN capabilities to go through a SOX proxy. Although, it, it's definitely a good thing and, like, one of the easiest ways to do so because most of the times you want to encrypt things is your web traffic. Yes, which gives you most of the time. I think I tried the SSH tunnel once, and I forget what I got hung up on. I think I got hung up on, like, setting up the... Uh, the keys or there's some weird thing i got hung up on actually it was for me once i figured out how to set up the dynamic ports for the Sox proxy it worked for me um so speaking about keys and stuff i have finally uh enabled uh login by public key to my server login by public key meaning that you just uh say ssh Username at server name and it just takes you right in. Yep, pretty much. Nice. It is a time saver. So uh, another thing is I've enabled uh, two-factor authentication on a lot of things, uh, except my Google account because I'm kind of paranoid that I might get locked out of something at some point. See, that's the thing: is the Google Gmail account is so important. It's like to not be able to get in. That was super important. So, but uh, one of the things that I have discovered is that there are plugins to KeyPass that will not only store your SSH private key, but also your uh, one-time use passwords as well. Oh, nice. So, uh, like, one of the uh, main reasons I wanted to get my uh, get a smartphone was to generate these one-time uh, codes. So instead of, like, having them texted to you, like, you just, you know, have them on your phone, right? Yes. Um... So I finally was able to do that. So I have them on my phone, but what if I lost my phone? Then I lost pretty much everything, right? Yes. So you can have them into uh, KeyPass here, which, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yes, Star Citizen. Apparently Robert Space Industries has uh, one-time passwords. So you can just you know go ahead and type that in. You know. Nice. And so that, that figures out the time, it's whatever, with their algorithms, or iter I see the timer ticking down, yes, and one right. is going to change, it did, at that point in time. That's really neat. Yes. So that's a plugin. That uh, sounds like that's an appreciate, then, uh, Yes. of the, the plugin, then? Yes, and I'll go ahead and appreciate the other plugin for the, uh, the key pass, or uh, for the SSH stuff. So, yeah. Very nice. So, yes, I use the elliptic curve keys. Um, so at some point, I want to uh, uh, migrate uh, everything over to, I think it's uh, ED20, or no, ED25519 uh, keys, uh, which is like another kind of elliptic curve, but is supposedly a little more secure than everything else. So... Uh, but unfortunately, it's so new that the e ecosystem doesn't quite support it yet, uh, at least outside of uh, Open SSH. Yeah. So, I mean, Putty is not Open SSH. Does it not support it then? Not yet. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. I think maybe in the uh, nightly builds, but on in the release one. Okay, so it's coming then. Yeah. So, uh, you know, then like, you might think it's like, oh, well, Open SSH supports it. You know, you can use it, yet yeah, if you only use OpenSSH. But Putty is not that. Um, like many of the uh, SFTP clients you might be using uh, with your uh, SSH daemon uh, might not be OpenSSH either. So they need to support those too. So likely SCP works, though. Yes, but uh, yeah, uh, fun times are afoot. Yes, 
So, but before I, uh, you know, reformat my server, I might want to figure out how to run, uh, was it like open street view? Uh, because like a while ago I was trying to get open street view running on my server. So like, it's essentially like Google maps, but like, you know, the open source alternative to that. So I uh, think initially what I wanted to do was, uh, like set up a geocoder. Okay which, you know, essentially translates an address into geographic coordinates. Okay. So I think I was initially looking into this because at work I was trying to geocode, like, a list of all these physical stores. I, I remember something about this. This was, like, a couple of years ago, maybe yeah. three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. But at some point I it kind of got hard, and I'm like, ugh. You know, I was like, just forget about this. Uh, which... Yeah, I think I still have some configuration left, and I'm not sure if that was the problem. So, like, I want to make sure that I know how to do this before I nuke it and clear it. So, if I don't know how to do this, I won't do it and, like, clog up my server. I see. So, I don't think that you have anything quite that interesting in plans. Going camping. Yeah. That's that's pretty good there. I am taking a class right now, though, on uh, something like, I forget the control systems is the official title. Basically, it's applying math to controlling robots. An opening example they used in the class was, say, robots approaching a wall. How can you, like, make a curve of the acceleration so that it deaccelerates, like, right before it touches the wall? So it's, like, perfectly is at the position of the wall without crashing into it. Instead, right. it just stops right at the wall. So that's been interesting. It's only a month long, uh, so I've it's seems to be quite a bit. Though I didn't finish the first week all the way, but it's not due till the end of the month. So I have all this time, but yeah. So I've been working on that. So pretty much, yeah, that's what's going on. Not blacksmithing since I've been busy with that. Yep, and I will try to continue to ride my bike, although it's been deathly humid and uh, chance of thunderstorms. I did see that on the weather. Uh, I think it was this morning I, I was on a TV and it was like showing this week's forecast and it's like thunderstorms, thunderstorms, th like the whole whole week. Yeah. And it's like weekend forecast. I'm like, well, this would be different. Thunderstorms. thunderstorms. I'm like, what? <laughs> so uh, I, I was wondering for a second there if someone was just having fun and just decided to write thunderstorms all over the weather <laughs> or if maybe the system went bad or maybe it's legitly going to thunder. Don't know. Well, speaking of, so it wasn't yesterday but last the Monday of last week. Um, so I'm just, you know, riding along just fine. You know, I, let's see, I think I was maybe about 10 miles, well, maybe not quite that much, maybe eight miles into a 12 mile trip. You know, I'm turning around, I'm going back uh -huh. towards, you know, the T station. And, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, there's like maybe a little bit of clouds and stuff. But suddenly it starts raining hard, like buckets and sheets hard. Mm hmm so I'm like, okay, well, this can't last long. So, you know, I pull over and, like, I stand under a tree for a few minutes until it starts raining under the tree. <laughs> so by this time, everything is literally soaked. And I'm like, well, there's, like, a bridge another mile and a half up the road or up the trail. Just sit underneath the bridge and, like, wait for it to pass. So, like, while I'm there... I become fully soaked in, you know, like my, uh, the biking jersey, the bike pants, like even all the way down to my shoes. <laughs> you know, everything's wet. So, uh, yeah, if I had a bar of soap, I might have showered right there. <laughs> but, um, like I was planning on, you know, like washing everything anyway. Uh, and I think that makes a fitting end to that pair of shoes because, like, like when I was uh, writing the T there, like I could, I actually saw them like pulling apart. Your shoes the whole part. Okay, yeah. but that was before they got wet. So yeah, I got some sand in my uh, nether regions. <laughs> just just because like all this mud and stuff was flinging everywhere. It's never good. So yeah, so I guess we'll. Uh, Try this again later. See ya. See ya.